A brief look at Gregorian chant to start with. Pope Gregory the Great, whose memorial is celebrated on the 3rd of September, has been credited with many things, including the writing, collecting or organizing of the body of plain chant in use at the time, as well as founding the first singing school, Scola Cantorum, in Rome to train singers for the church, organizing the church's annual cycle of liturgical readings and first establishing the church's authority over the secular rulers of Rome. There are any number of lovely stories and legends associated with Gregory. There are paintings showing a bird singing chants into his ear as he wrote them down. Unfortunately, of course, there was no usable music notation at the time. There are stories of his sending out missionaries with instructions to bring back any new music they encountered, saying, why should the devil have all the good songs? Whether he actually did any of these things is questionable. They were attributed to him in later centuries in an attempt to build up and support the primacy of the papacy. Those who attributed wondrous accomplishments to Gregory were doing the same job that spin doctors do today, perhaps for politicians and entertainers. Contemporary Church Music For decades, there's been concern in many corners of the church that Catholic music is in crisis. The 1992 book, Why Catholics Can't Sing, outlined a history of modern Catholic liturgical music and a rapid shift away from traditional chants and hymns in the later part of the 20th century. Writer Damien Thompson decreed bad Catholic music such as folk and jazz inspired worship songs in a 2015 essay in the British publication The Catholic Herald. Most recently, concerns were raised that some common Catholic hymns are not only musically lacking, but doctrinally questionable. Much of the critique of contemporary liturgical music lies in the reforms of the Second Vatican Council and how they were carried out. Critics attest that when interpreting the changes of the Second Vatican Council, many dioceses and parishes cut out important parts of the church's liturgical heritage, displaced the rich history of chant with other forms of music, and substituted suggested sung prayers with hymns resembling popular performance songs. While this may certainly be the case in many places, other musical scholars affirm that it is actually the reforms of the Second Vatican Council that only not only preserve the rich liturgical history the Roman Catholic Church had used for centuries, but allows that tradition to grow. While they may share many of the same critiques of some popular works and trends in certain kinds of liturgical music, they also say that mass music is getting better and that it is getting better because the Church has preserved what is good from centuries past and is also providing avenues for worthwhile contributions from other traditions and the modern day. Rather than detract from the church's musical heritage, the church is now in a place to restore and add to it. The abundance of music composed over the centuries and still apt for the liturgy is staggering. It is a sign of the Holy Spirit's continuing inspiration to artists throughout human history. In the tradition, and with the help of guidelines laid down in the Second Vatican Council, the Church has all it needs for beautiful liturgical music. New music, scholars say, is an important part of this revival of musical traditions the Church has saved. The Church admits all worthy art into her liturgy and the Second Vatican Council makes that absolutely clear. New compositions have always come into the Church. But in order to see where liturgical music is going, 
it's important to understand where it came from. The Roots of Sacred Music Music isn't just an important addition to the liturgy, added as an extension of praise and worship. For much of the church's history, music has been an essential part of the liturgy itself. The inclusion goes back to the very earliest days of the church, to the Last Supper. We know that Christ and his disciples sang a hymn at the Last Supper. Singing quickly was mandated during many parts of early church celebrations. Over the centuries, Catholic theology developed to explain why the union of sacred music and text was such an important element of worship that arose from these early traditions. The Roman Catholic Church also continued to intertwine music and prayer into nearly every part of its liturgy. Within the Roman Catholic Church, there are some elements that change to reflect both daily prayers and readings and set elements of the liturgy that remain steady throughout the year. The parts that change daily are called the proper and the elements which remain the same are called the ordinary. Yet within recent decades, some of these elements are rarely heard because their use is highly suggested but not mandatory. While the parts of the Mass ordinary, such as the Kyrie, Sanctus or the Agnus Dei, namely the Lord of Mercy, Holy Holy and Lamb of God, remain largely constant and cannot be omitted from the liturgy except under specific circumstances, many parts of the proper have fallen from daily use. When these elements from the propers are dropped, parishes leave out important music that has special relevance to the prayers of the day. And these propers are the words the church wants us to hear sing today. The specificity and messages of these texts and their accompanying psalms is mirrored in every other proper text of the liturgy. While many parishes neglected the propers after the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, many churches are starting to bring them back into popular use. In our day, the propers, specifically the entrance and communion antiphons, are making a very strong return, not only in the major churches, but in many parishes. Evolving Traditions while the church prescribes that some parts of the liturgy should be sung when possible, how a congregation places these parts to music can vary by a parish's cultural and its own liturgical traditions. The church in her rites accommodates the languages and select elements specific to individual cultures a custom extending back to the early church. The practice of incorporating appropriate cultural elements into the liturgy, also called enculturation, is a two-way street. In the process, authentic cultural values and traditions are integrated into Christianity and Christianity impacts culture. Authentic accommodation of culture and tradition must respect the essential unity of the liturgy and the balance between culture and liturgy must be done carefully. When this respect for both liturgy and culture takes root, however, it can be a manifestation of the church's universality. Modern liturgical pieces take what's best in the music in our own time and what can be made fitting for the temple of God and divine worship. Generally, of course, music for church needs to be a bit more stylistically timeless than music for the secular sphere, not to say that good things can't be brought in. In addition, 
Music intended for the liturgy should remain focused on its purpose and role. They can be challenging, of course, but should never be jarring or distract from the meaning of the divine text or from the purpose of worship for which music is made. One of the goals of liturgical music could be to create a piece that is singable and is clearly liturgical and yet is in conversation with the current state of the musical world. Finding the balance between modern elements and liturgical music is an interesting challenge. The key in writing liturgical pieces has been using modern elements and tones as part of the palette of approaches. Drawing on jazz music for inspiration means using surprising turns and harmonies that don't really sound like anything else. It's important for mass music to sound different from other kinds of music we may hear. What happens at the Mass when God becomes present at the altar is not something that happens in any part of the rest of your life. The truth of what's happening at Mass is so different than everything else that the music needs to be reflective of that somehow. Creating these works is ultimately about giving our gifts back to God. In the Second Vatican Council, it says that sacred music is the most valuable treasure of all the artistic treasures the Church has. That if each of us can be a small part of that, then what better use of our skills could there be? But as Church music moves forward in the third millennium, how does all of this translate for the average parish? How to choose good liturgical music is not only a theoretical issue, but also a practical one. The challenge, as it would be at any parish, is balancing music that is both of quality and liturgically appropriate, as well as easily accessible for prayer. There's a legitimate question, not only about a given piece's quality, but also its style. Not every pleasant piece is appropriate for mass, and this guideline cuts across genres of music. On the other hand, many pieces that are not considered high art are worthy of being sung at mass. Does it get beyond, oh I love this, or to I can pray with this? The approach is settled on when searching for music is to look for really legitimate things that come from people's culture, but do it very carefully and as high quality as possible within the style. Music directors should consider both the liturgical season and the church's daily readings, propers and prayers in order to create the highest degree of unity between liturgy, prayer and music. It's important when we're asking people to embody that prayer in song that it's coming from very informed choices. That is the goal. That what you put in people's mouths is worthy, is appropriate, is liturgically appropriate, is pastorally appropriate and is musically appropriate. A word about sacred instrumental music. Musical instruments either accompanying the singing or played alone can add a great deal to liturgical celebrations. The pipe organ is to be held in high esteem for it is the traditional musical instrument that adds a wonderful splendor to the church's ceremonies and powerfully lifts up the spirit to God and to higher things. But other instruments also may be admitted for use in divine worship with the knowledge and consent of the competent territorial authority. This may be done, however, on the condition that the instruments are suitable or can be made suitable for sacred use, are in accord with the dignity of the place of worship and truly contribute to the uplifting of the faithful. In conclusion, 
Among the many signs and symbols used by the church to celebrate its faith, music is of preeminent importance. As sacred song is united to words, it forms a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. Yet the function of music is ministerial. It must serve and never dominate. Music should assist the assembled believers to express and share the gift of faith that is within them and to nourish and strengthen their interior commitment of faith. It should heighten the texts so that they speak more fully and more effectively. The quality of joy and enthusiasm which music adds to community worship cannot be gained in any other way. It imparts a sense of unity to the assembly and sets the appropriate tone for a particular celebration. May all of us truly be liturgically, musically literate. I pray that each of us joyfully join in every celebration of our liturgies, singing God's praises. He who sings, prays twice. Good evening friends and welcome to this evening's prayer service. We thank and praise God for the gift of church music. Every time that we come to church, the Eucharist is enhanced through singing, through the cantors, through the musicians. And today, we praise and thank God for each one of them. And so as we gather together, as a family, we thank God for blessing each and every one of us with the gift to sing. During these days of the pandemic, at home we sing. We may sing during the time of the rosary, during the time of our personal prayer, during the time of the adoration, during the time of the Holy Eucharist. And when we sing, we praise God twice. And so this evening, my dear friends, let us come in the presence of the Lord as we sing to the mountains, sing to the seas. Let all our praises give glory to God.
Jesus. As we come to an end of this day, we want to thank you, Lord, for all the gifts and talents that you have blessed us with. Lord, today we realize that even when we sing, we can praise you and thank you. Thank you for blessing each and every one of us with a gift to sing. Lord, every time that we sing, we can praise you, glorify you. Yes, my dear friends, this evening, I invite each and every one of you to remember and pray for all the choirs in the parish. Yes, we miss them every Sunday. Every Sunday they will come to sing for us, to sing so that we can glorify God, we can come more closer to God. And so wherever you are in this moment, I invite you, my dear friends, to remember every choir in your parish. And let's thank God for giving them to the church. For all those who sing during the weekday masses, the cantons. Let's thank God for all the gift of our cantors who come early in the morning, who come in the evening, in spite of all their work schedules, yes, they come and they glorify God. They lead us more closer to God. Even as we look towards Jesus, let's remember and pray for all our cantors in our parish. Wherever they may be, we pray that the Lord will bless them this evening. And we pray for all our choirs this evening, that they will continue to glorify God through the beautiful voices that God has given them. And so we maintain a moment of silence and let's pray at this moment. So oh. 
Dear friends, our hearts are like a flute and we want to play all day because Jesus Christ is my music master. Deep from my heart flows a simple melody. Great is his love, love without end. Yes, friends, as we praise and thank God for this beautiful evening that we have spent together, Let's all sing together our final hymn, My Heart's Like a Flute. Gentle as touch, he brought. 